Hey everybody, back for part two here. Uh, getting everything pulled back up. Last thing that we talked about was Columbus being the world's uh, most famous failure, or uh, I guess the world's most uh, successful failure because he didn't do anything that he attempted to do, but you know, his goal was to find a faster route to uh, find a faster route to Asia. He didn't do that. He failed four. He failed four times trying to make it to the New World and died penniless. But we're still talking about him 500 years later, uh, 500 plus years later. Now, uh, as the Spanish, you know, Columbus did start the Spanish colonial empire in the Americas. I will give him that, but that's about the last positive thing you'll hear me say about Columbus. Uh, that's another thing. As If you haven't had me before, you'll find out as the year goes on, whether it's in these videos or whether it's in person in class, uh, we, you, you will witness, I have a tendency to go on rants about things. Last year, I think the best one was about petitions, about miss, uh, the Captain Marvel movies, but I digress. As the Spanish start to establish their colonial empires, you know, they, they introduce new things to the colonies in the Americas and all of the new plant life that you know, you found in the Americas completely changed the European diet and economy. Uh, roughly 60% of the crops grown today in the Western world originated in the New World, in the Americas. Uh, things like tobacco, corn, beans of various types, tomatoes. You know, of course, when you think tomatoes, what do you think? A lot of you probably think Italian. But tomatoes actually ended up in Italy because Columbus was a native of Italy. He was not Spanish. He just sailed for Spain. But tomatoes made it to Italy from the New World. And also what I refer to as the lowly potato. Uh, the potato came from the New World. It's a very durable root. Uh, you know, grows underground. It can grow in rocky soil, sandy soil. Uh, you know, it, it's underground, so it doesn't have to have light. I mean, you could literally grow, if you had a dirt floor uh, cabin or dirt floor, you know, little stone hut, you could still grow potatoes in the corner of your house. Uh, and, and like I said, they are very durable. You know, they're they're very hardy and, you know, they withstand a, a greater range of temperatures than uh, crops that grow, you know, as long as you get them out of the ground before there would be a frost or something. Uh, which, because they grew in poor soil, poor tenant farmers tended to grow potatoes and live off of potatoes because the better land the best land they had had to go towards growing crops that they had to turn over to the landlord so they had to live off of potatoes and some groups russian peasants irish peasants they lived primarily off of potatoes that's why i refer to it as the lowly potato very quickly the potato gains a reputation for being able to grow it just about anywhere and only the poorest of the poor ate potatoes. You, you wouldn't lower yourself to eating a potato because that meant that you were, as the term says, dirt poor. If you had poor quality soil, you were dirt poor. Well, if you were dirt poor, you probably ate potatoes. Uh, completely apart from U.S. history, but just an example of the bad reputation that potatoes had Going into the French Revolution in 1789, there had been very bad, the, the French peasantry, the French population in total, lived off of wheat, lived off, to, lived off of bread. And potatoes had such a bad reputation that in 1788 and in 1789, 
the or maybe it was 87 and 88 going into the summer of 89 the wheat crops had suffered greatly one year it was because of drought the other year it was because of hailstorms early in the growing season crippled the crop so a lot of it died off before it matured uh, the following year it was because of a lack of rain and due to drought it stunted the growth there wasn't as much wheat so you had where the vast majority of the population ate wheat, uh, ate flour ate bread you know flour products but you had two straight growing seasons where the harvest was very crippled so it led to wheat shortages of course wheat gets milled into flour because you have flour shortages the price of flour went up that means that the price of bread went up and it went as far as the king louis the 16th he advertised whether he was lying or not he advertised that even the king enjoys the taste of potatoes well the french pop, uh, population didn't like king louis the 16th and if he ate potatoes they certainly weren't that's what backfired on him but another thing was is the french would not lower themselves to eating potatoes because the the root itself had such a bad reputation that if you ate you know who eats potatoes irish and russian peasants so you know there's no way that the french were going to do that they would rather starve which a lot of French did starve going into the summer of revolution in 1789. But back to American history here. A lot of these crops, when they're introduced to Africa, they help offset the increased population growth that uh, it also helped as time went on, it helped increase population growth because now you had new sources of food making it into Africa. And that, in some regions, did help offset the depopulation of the slave trade as it carried on from the early 1500s forward. Now, uh, a lot of things made it from the New World to Europe, from the New World to Africa, but, you know, things came, you know, it was a two-way street. A lot of things came from Europe to the New World uh, in 1493. First horses were brought in to the island of Hispaniola by the time you get to uh, Cortez in 1519. Well, by the time you get to 1550, you have horses all over modern day Mexico going up into what would be the American Southwest. And by the time you get to 1700, even though, you know, the British hadn't moved that far west, by 1700, you had herds, you know, thousands of wild stallions wild horses roaming as far north as you know western canada uh columbus ended up introducing sugarcane to the caribbean islands he finds out that the climate you know very warm very humid closer to the equator so uh, you have milder much milder winters uh it's found out that sugarcane thrived you know which originally it was from asia had been introduced to the west coast of africa by the portuguese columbus brings some seeds with him and you know ends up trying them again over the course of being there after they landed on hispaniola the first time with the first voyage plant some before he even left you saw that because of the warmth because of the humidity i mean right now it's late august early september and i don't know how many of you all are the ones that have to mow the yard at your house but it feels like to me, you know, you mow the yard and you go out the next day and you can see where the grass has already, you know, in places the grass has already grown like a half an inch. Uh, sugar cane grows that fast. Sugar, you can see visibly from day to day, you can see sugar cane grow. The problem with sugar cane is it's extremely labor dependent. Uh, it takes a tremendous amount of manual la labor to grow, harvest, and refine sugarcane. And because of that, and the fact that this is a new cash crop, I mean, sugar was highly sought after in the European nations. Uh, so when they find out that, hey, sugarcane grows on these islands, the Spanish start 
you know, claiming land, every island that they come across. They claim it, and they, you know, people come in by the land, and they start growing sugarcane because it's something that's going to make money for them. Well, because you need heavy labor, they start using Native Americans. But the thing is, as the Native Americans come into heavier contact with Europeans, they end up succumbing to European diseases that are brought over from uh, Europe then once you start to see dwindling populations of the natives you got to find another source of manual labor and you know the spanish aren't going to work the land that they they had no intention of working the land themselves so what they do is they take a page out of those middle eastern merchants that they had been in contact with for a couple of hundred years and they start getting involved in the African slave trade. And it's, I believe, let me see, jump ahead here. It's not here, but I, I want to say it was like 1522, and I might have it on a later slide. I want to say it was like 1522, the first recorded ship of African slaves being brought into the Americas by the Spanish. Uh, and I might even be wrong about that. It might have been as early as 1517 before Cortez even made it to the mainland. Uh, I'll, I'll have to look that up because now I'm wondering. Uh, but it was either 1517 or maybe 1522 that the first ship, first Spanish ship brought African slaves into the Caribbean to start working the sugarcane fields. Now, uh, unfortunately, another thing that Europeans brought with them, as I said, was disease. You know, that the natives had no immunities to. So the closer you came into contact with Europeans as a native, it's kind of like what we're dealing with right now with the coronavirus. You know, some people are, uh, you know, some people, they don't really get sick, but they could still be a carrier and they could pass it on to someone who would be more susceptible to the, the worst side of that disease. Uh, but the natives had no immunities to things like smallpox, malaria, measles, plagues of different types. Specific when, when you usually hear plague, you think bubonic plague. Within 50 years of Spanish arrival, the island of Hispaniola, which again, they didn't do a full census, but it was estimated that about a million natives lived on the island of Hispaniola. It was down to 200 natives by the time you get to 1545, 1550. Uh, just completely devastated the population because, you know, it's an island that people can't get away from it. And as more and more Spanish come to that island, because that was the first settlement, as the population density increases, the natives have nowhere to go to escape uh, the spread of those European diseases, and it almost completely wipes out the native population. 1519, uh, Hernan Cortez, a conquistador, which a conquistador, it just, in Spanish, it just means conqueror. Uh, he and a group of, he had a group of soldiers, roughly 300 men. They had 16 horses and 11 ships, and their orders were to establish a foothold on the mainland. They were not traders. You know, they were not explorers. They were there to take the land, take control for the Spanish, establish a beachhead, push inland, subdue the natives, and create a situation where the Spanish could move inland. Because if there were, if there was this much land on the islands and natural resources, there have to be more resources on the mainland. Uh, within two years. Cortez had conquered the Aztecs. Uh, he had laid siege to the Aztec capital. Eventually it fell. Disease played a role there. Uh, weakened the Aztecs. Cortez had gathered up, you know, since he spent six months, eight months with the Aztecs on friendly terms uh, before the greed of the Spaniards had caused the Aztecs to drive them out of the capital. Uh, Cortez had gotten to know the Aztecs. He had gotten to know their enemies, their allies. The, the thing is with the Aztec Empire, you know, in Central America, the natives were just like 
the natives in North America, you had different tribes. The Aztecs had created this huge sprawling civilization, but they, you weren't necessarily an Aztec because you lived in their territory. They conquered a lot of smaller tribes. They subjugated a lot of smaller groups of Central American natives. And there was plenty of reason for, you know, if you know anything about the Aztecs, they were big on human sacrifice. And they didn't sacrifice Aztecs unless they absolutely had to. Uh, Generally, they would pull sacrifices from the smaller villages, the smaller groups that weren't technically Aztecs but they were subjugated by the Aztec people. And Cortez knew who the enemies were, that he knew who the groups were that had a reason to hate the Aztecs. So when he got, when he and his men got driven out of the capital, he goes around and, you know, after six, eight months, there are a couple of people in his small army of a couple of hundred men that they were linguists. You know, that was their thing, you know, language, you know, you take Spanish with Miss Lopez. Some people just take to foreign languages easier than others. Well, they had learned enough of the regional dialects that they could communicate, or at least they could communicate with this one guy from one village that even though you had a different tribe at this village a few miles away, he could go in and he could talk to the other natives. And Cortez built an army mainly out of rival native tribes that had a reason to hate the Aztecs. And then he had his 300 men that had steel armor, that had uh, firearms, and they ended up wiping the Aztecs out, you know, taking out their leadership and subjugating the ones that survived. Uh, By the time, 100 years after Cortez, by 1620, the native population of Mexico had dropped from 20 million natives down to only 2 million because of disease primarily, but also from treatment by the Spanish settlers. Uh, Mainly not because they were just treated badly outright, but the Spanish were very brutal in the sense that if you defied Spanish leadership, then you, you you would be crushed. If they tried to rise up and drive the Spanish out, the Spanish were going to keep sending soldiers until they put down whatever revolt might have been occurring. Uh, Like I said, you know, and that's the way that the Spanish conquest of the Americas is looked at, is that it was all brutal, it was all violent, but that's not necessarily the case. The Spanish did bring some positive uh, aspects. That's not to say that the negative aspects don't outweigh the positive aspects. They definitely do. You know, tens of millions of natives end up getting wiped out because of treatment, because of disease. Uh, But the Spanish brought, you know, they introduced just the same way that new crops were introduced to Europe from the Americas. The Spanish end up bringing new crops to the Americas. They introduce new animals, you know, like the horse that becomes very important for the native populations. Uh, You know, not just the Spanish language, but also you're going to have some sailors from different countries that would be working on Spanish ships. So you're going to introduce European languages. Uh, One thing that the Spanish kind of force on the natives is they try to force religion, you know, the Christian faith, uh, Spanish customs, way of life, you know, Spanish laws. That's what the natives are going to live by, even though they hadn't up until that point. And there was, in in the case of laws, customs, and religion, it was you accept the Spanish way of life, and that's it. There's no there's no questioning, there's no debate, and if you try to refuse, it's it's going to get ugly very quickly. Um, the Spanish even intermarried with the surviving native population. Now, this generally tends to be more towards the working class, not necessarily in the upper class, the nobility in the colonies. But you did have Spanish. It was actually, uh, it was actually an idea that was promoted by the Spanish crown, because if you intermarry with the native population, then what happens is you create family bonds, and they hoped that that was a way that would make it easier to subjugate the native population, because now they are family with Spanish citizens. This creates an entire new ethnic group and social uh, level in the hierarchy 
the mestizo people, you know, is a mix people of mixed heritage, mixed native and European heritage. Excuse me. Now, in terms of after the Spanish are established in the mainland, within 50 years of Columbus's discovery, there are hundreds of Spanish cities. There are, you know, over a dozen moving towards, you know, I mean, to this day, there are over 20 countries in Central and South America where Spanish is the primary language, you know, and that all of their cultures, while there are native influence as well, in Central America and South America, all of their cultures are influenced to some degree by Spanish colonization during the 1500s, 1600s, 1700s. But what you see in the first 50 years is the Spanish push really hard to take Spanish culture and just lay it over their American colonies. Uh, like I said, with the Christian faith, the Catholic uh, religion in particular. They build these great cathedrals. They bring the printing press, which helps the spread of uh, the written and spoken Spanish language. Uh, in a lot of cases, if you were a native and you were dealing with Spanish colonial citizens, you were required to speak Spanish. Uh, you have the building of great universities. You know, in Central America, you had the university in uh, University of Mexico City. In South America, after uh, the Incan uh, civilization was conquered by the Spanish, you know, the area of Peru, you have the University of Lima established. You know, that was one of the things is while there were great prestigious universities in Europe, the Spanish wanted to create prestigious centers of learning in the Americas as well. So you had distinguished universities, you know, that ha even had a high reputation in Europe established in Central and South America before the English ever stepped foot on American soil. Uh, you know, Jamestown isn't established until 1607. By 1550, both of these universities and also there would be smaller universities, you know, not a lot, but there would be smaller universities in other areas. But Mexico City and the University of Lima were the two biggest. Uh, now, after the Spanish, after Columbus and after the Spanish begin colonizing, you do see the English poking around North America a little bit. Uh, John Cabot was actually Italian. His name was Giovanni Cabato, but the anglicized or English version of his name is John Cabot. And, you know, in English history, that's the name that was used. He, even as early as five years after Columbus's first voyage, he explored the northern coast of North America, uh, North America up in uh, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and mm, slightly down the uh, New England coast. You get into the early 1500s, the French start to get involved simply because the English had started sending uh, exploratory voyages to the Americas. Uh, another Italian, Giovanni de Verrazzano, he sailed for France, even though, like Columbus, like Cabot, he was actually English. Uh, 1524, he explored a little farther down the eastern seaboard. And around this time, this is when the Spanish start to get a little antsy. You know, this is 1524, and each time after this, the, the French are going to creep a little farther down. You know, the I can't remember exactly how far Verrazano, de Verrazano had gone. Maybe he went down as far south as Virginia. Well, the next expedition by the French is maybe going to go down to South Carolina and then might be creeping towards Georgia. The problem is, is that the Spanish are wary of other countries, the English, the French, the Dutch, whoever, getting too close to the Caribbean islands because there is so much money to be made from sugarcane. So what the Spanish do in 1565 is they found St. Augustine. St. Augustine is the oldest permanent settlement established in North America, in North America. Uh, it wasn't by the English. It wasn't by the French. The first permanent settlement in North America was established by the Spanish. St. Augustine was supposed to be a, originally it was a monastery, but it looked suspiciously like a fort. Uh, it was heavily armed and 
there was also always a contingent of Spanish Navy that were left patrolling the waters around St. Augustine. Now, St. Augustine was far enough up, up along the Florida coast that it guaranteed that no British or French ships that kind of snooped their way down the uh, Atlantic seaboard, they're not, they're going to run into these Spanish naval vessels well before they ever get into Caribbean waters. And it was just a way for the, the St. Augustine, the monastery at St. Augustine was kind of the Spanish planning a little keep out sign on the Florida coast. You know, don't go past this point or you're going to have some major problems with us. Uh, inland, uh, north of Mexico, in the 1540s, the Spanish had started moving north up into the Rio Grande. Uh, you jump ahead almost 50 years. In 1598, conquistadors end up entering the Rio Grande Valley because the native population wasn't necessarily willing to listen to the Spanish. Uh, you know, they they didn't like being told what to do by these people that were coming into their territory. And after conquistadors, like I said, these people weren't explorers. Conquistadors were soldiers. And when they move into a region, bad things are going to happen. Things are going to get violent. In the following year, 1599, you had the Battle of Acoma. The conquistador, uh, conquistadors killed many Pueblo warriors. And I'm sure they also killed women and children, elderly as well. But everyone that survived the Battle of Acoma had their right foot cut off at the ankle. Uh, this was meant to send a message to anyone, whether they were Pueblo or not, that if you defy the Spanish, this is what's going to happen to you. Uh, it didn't keep the Pueblo. It didn't keep other native groups from fighting. But it did send its message, and one of the things it did more than anything else is it created a deep-seated hatred among the natives towards the Spanish and towards Europeans in general. Uh, you jump ahead to 1609, you have the, the first time you have a territory or a colony of a colony. You know, Mexico by this point was highly populated. They start to spread to the north. The Rio Grande Valley had been... Uh, solidified under Spanish control. So 1609, you have the development of what they called the New Mexico Territory. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, the Spanish, things never really panned out in terms of, you know, Columbus in 1492, uh, after his first expedition, he goes back to Europe and he talks about how there is so much gold and silver. I mean, basically, as soon as we got out of our boats, we were tripping over gold nuggets, you know, or hunks of silver ore, you know, it's just all over the place. So that's one of the things that caused the Spanish to come to the new world in such droves is because everybody was coming expecting to get rich. And you hear stories, you hear legends about, you know, Ponce de Leon and the Fountain of Youth somewhere in Florida or somewhere along the Gulf Coast. You hear about El Dorado, the city of gold. Supposedly it was this native city, whether it was Aztecs or some earlier uh, native group, uh, native uh, civilization where the streets were paved with gold. Gold was so plentiful that they didn't build their buildings. They didn't build their roads out of stone. They built them out of solid gold blocks. And, you know, that really drove, you know, and it, and it could have been a legend. It very well could have been a legend that the natives told some of the Spanish in hopes that they would get out of my area you know, it, it's not here. You have to travel about three weeks to the northwest, and that's where you'll find it. Uh, it could have been just a marketing strategy by some landowners in the colonies talking about how these people were going to uh, the Mexico colony and striking it rich. Uh, you know, we really don't know where the legend came from, but... Obviously, you know, that was some, the desire of people to go to the new world, start a new life, find wealth, and live happily ever after. And it drives millions of people. 
over the years, whether we're talking about the Spanish, whether we're talking about the English, the first settlers in Jamestown, uh, some of the survivors of the ja early Jamestown colony talked about how when the first boat made landfall, you had guys jumping out of the rowboats, throwing their bags on the you know rocky, it wasn't a sandy beach, it was a kind of a rocky beach, and they, because they, they, came ashore at the mouth of a river and they start running ashore and all they grabbed out of their packs, they didn't worry about starting a fire. They didn't worry about securing shelter, getting off of the coast for when the tide came in. They ran straight to the riverbanks and they got those little plates out and they started seining, trying to find little flakes of gold so they could make a claim and start mining for gold. And it didn't really pan out because I don't know if you all have ever heard, but gold's not really it never was really found in high amounts in Virginia but they just heard these stories from English you know from the joint stock company uh, the Virginia company whether it was stories that had moved throughout Europe from Spain about these legends of gold it, it just pardon the very bad pun but keep in mind I am a father so dad jokes come naturally all those stories about getting rich quick never really panned out yeah please don't leave any negative comments i'm sorry I, I, i'm not really sorry uh say what you will i don't care now uh the missionaries spanish missionaries they weren't accepting of native customs therefore if you didn't speak spanish if you were not open to adopting christianity the natives were treated very, very harshly. In 1680, you have Pope's Rebellion, uh, another Pueblo resistance where the natives gathered together, their warriors gathered together, and they started storming Spanish settlements, which at this point in the New Mexico Territory, Spanish settlements tended to be, if they didn't live in a monastery like the Alamo, that, you know, that was a mission settlement. But if they didn't live in the mission itself, their settlements were around the monastery that was built. So, you know, it was kind of like everybody in one place. And the Pueblo ended up killing 20 priests, hundreds of Spanish settlers in the region. So, of course, what happens is the Spanish, the Mexican government ends up sending conquistadors into the New Mexico territory. And it ends up leading to five decades of conflict between the natives in the region and Spanish settlers. It took the Spanish 50 years. You know, you're well into the 18th century. It was around 1725, 1730, before the Spanish really fully regained control of their New Mexico colony. 1716, Spain starts to begin settling in Texas. This includes the Alamo, which I've already mentioned and will eventually become important to American history. But, uh, for Mexican history, really, it, it was just one of the initial buildings built in the San Antonio settlement. Uh, and that's the way that it usually went. The, the mission where the uh, monks, the priests, the missionaries would live and a church are generally going to be the first buildings built in a Spanish colonial settlement. Uh, 1769, a... Uh, Franciscan monk, uh, Father Unipero Serra, ends up founding the settlement of San Diego, which is going to end up becoming, you know, now Los Angeles is bigger, San Francisco is bigger, but San Diego was founded all the way back when, you know, this was Spanish territory, and it became a larger settlement for the Spanish, at least in Southern California. Almost finished here, finally, I know you're like, now, much of the mistreatment of the Native Americans led to what's referred to as the black legend of Spanish colonization, saying that everything was death and destruction. But the black legend does ignore a lot of positive things that the Spanish did in the New World. Again, I'm not saying that the positive aspects wipe out the negative aspects. They don't. But it's not fair to say that nothing positive came out of Spanish colonization. You know, they bring their culture, their customs to the Americas. It lays the foundation for, you know, right or wrong, it does lay the foundation for uh, 
roughly 20, I want to, I want to say it's like 22, 23 Spanish speaking nations. Uh, you know, Spain had a century head start on the English in terms of setting up colonies in the new world and their colonies while in it, you could chalk it up to the fact that there were so many Spanish colonies already established, but Spain starts its colonial empire a hundred years plus before the English ever set foot on North American soil. And the Spanish, the last Spanish colony doesn't fall until 25 years after the English colonies all kind of go by the wayside or the, at least the English colonial empire. I mean, to this day, there are still strong ties between the Canadian government and the British government. Uh, but, you know, that, that wraps it up for, I guess, that wraps it up here for chapter one. I know of. if you've watched all the way through these, you've stuck around a lot longer than uh, a lot of others probably had. So what I will do here is I'll go ahead and close this out before long. And just to let you know that, like I said, I'm going to try to do this. And hopefully I might do like this anyway. I might break it down into two videos instead of just one or as I get more used to doing this because like what I covered here in two videos relatively short videos this is probably about a week and a half maybe even two weeks of lecture and class so you might hate sitting through these if you did sit all the way through them but keep in mind I'm compacting like a week and a half two weeks of class into two videos and I don't know what it was was it an hour 45 minutes, hour and a half. I'm not sure. I kind of lose track of time when I get in here and start talking. But still, just bear with me because I am trying to compact a lot of this information, still give you some extra stuff other than just reading off the notes. Uh, but as I get more used to doing this, I will find better ways to kind of capsulate the information uh, and give you what you need to know without it just being a regurg regurgitation of what's on the slides. So. I'll talk to you all later, hopefully sooner or later in person. We'll see you.